Hey, you guys. Okay, so I'm going to read to you. We are going to start back up with Diary of Anne Frank. And it is raining right now outside. And you hear the thunder. And maybe you can hear some great uh, rain and nighttime sounds. And nothing is better for me than reading in the rain. And so I have this little outdoor couch on my deck. And so I thought, I'm going to lay on this and read to y'all. I wish you could be on my deck with me. Okay, here we go. We are starting on Sunday morning, July 5th, 1942. Our examination results were announced in the Jewish theater last Friday. I couldn't have hoped for better. My report is not bad at all. I had one Vic status, a five for algebra, two sixes, and the rest were all seven and eights. They were certainly pleased at home, although over the question of marks, my parents are quite different than most. They don't care a bit whether my reports are good or bad or as long as I'm happy and well and not too cheeky, then the rest will come by itself. I am just the opposite. I don't want to be a bad pupil. I should really have stayed in the seventh form in the Montessori school, but was accepted for the Jewish secondary school. When all the Jewish children had to go to Jewish schools, the headmaster took lies in me conditionally after a bit of persuasion. He relied on us to do our best. Whoopsie, my phone fell. He re relied on us to do our best and I don't want to let him down. My sister Margot has her report too, brilliant as usual. She would move up with cum, cum laude if that existed at school, she is so brainy. Daddy has been home a lot lately. As there is nothing for him to do at business, it must feel rotten to feel so superfluous. Mr. Kufus was taken over Travis and Mr. Crayler, the firm Cohan and Company. When we walked across our little square together a few days ago, Daddy began to talk about us going into hiding. I asked him why on earth he was beginning to talk of that already. Yes, Anne, he said, you know that we have been taking food, clothes, furniture to other people for more than a year now. We don't want our belongings to be seized or to be stolen and taken by the Germans but we certainly don't want to fall into their clutches ourselves. So we shall disappear on our own accord and not wait until they come and fetch us. But, but Daddy, when would that be? He spoke so seriously that I grew really anxious. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll arrange everything. Make the most of your carefree young life while you can. That was all. Oh, may the fulfillment of those somber words remain far distant yet. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, July 8th, 1942. Dear Kitty, years have seemed to pass between Sunday and now. So much has happened. It is just as if the whole world had turned upside down. But I'm still alive, Kitty, and that is the main thing that Daddy says. Hey, that's kind of like what happened to us, isn't it? We came and we were coming home for the weekend and then got an announcement on Sunday that we were not going back to school because of the pandemic, the coronavirus, and we're out of school for the rest of the year. So our world has turned upside down, just like her care, uh, and Frank's world has turned upside down. Let's continue. Yes, I'm still alive indeed, but don't ask where or how. You wouldn't understand a word, so I will begin by telling you what happened on Sunday afternoon. At three o'clock, Harry had just gone, but was coming back later. Somebody rang the front doorbell. I was lying lazily reading a book on the veranda in the sunshine, so I didn't hear it. A bit later, Margot appeared at the kitchen door looking really excited. 
The SS has sent a call up notice for daddy, she whispered. Mummy has gone to see Mr. Van Dan already. Now Van Dan is a friend who works with daddy in the business. It was a great shock to me, a call up. Everybody knows what that means. I, I picture a concentration camp and lonely cells. Should we allow him to be doomed to this? Of, of course he won't go, declared Margot while we waited together. Mummy has gone to the Van Dans to discuss whether we should move into our hiding place tomorrow. The Van Dans are going with us, so we shall be seven in all. Silence. We couldn't talk anymore thinking about Daddy, who, little knowing what was going on, was, vid was visiting some old people in the Judzi Invalide, waiting for mummy, the heat and suspense all made us very overwrought and silent. Suddenly the doorbell rang. This is Harry, I said. Don't open the door, Margot held me back, but it was not necessary as we heard mummy and Mr. Van Dan downstairs talking to Harry. Then they came in and closed the door behind them. Each time the bell went, Margot or I had to creep softly down to see if it was daddy, not opening the door to anybody else. Margot and I sent out, were sent out of the room. Van Dan wanted to talk to mummy alone. When we were alone together in our bedroom, Margot told me that the call up was not for daddy, but for her. I was more frightened than ever and I began to cry. Margot is only 16. Would they really take girls away that young? All alone? But thank goodness she won't go, Mummy said to herself. That must be what Daddy meant when he talked about us going into hiding. Into hiding. Where, where would we go? In a town or the country? In a house or a cottage? Where? How? When? These were questions I was not allowed to ask, but I couldn't get them out of my mind. Margot and I began to pack some of our most vital belongings into a school satchel. The first thing I put in was this diary, then hair curlers, handkerchiefs, school books, a comb, old letters. I put the craziest things with the idea that we were going into hiding, but I'm not sorry because memories mean more to me than dresses. Woo! That was some lightning, wasn't it? Okay, here we go. Yeah, okay. Jules. At five o'clock, Daddy. Stop. At five o'clock, Daddy finally arrived and we phoned Mr. Kufius to ask if he would come around in the evening. Van Dan went and fetched Meep. Meep had been in the business with Daddy since 1933 and has become a close friend. Likewise, her brand new husband, Hank. Meep came and took some shoes, dresses, coats, and underwear and stockings away in her bag, promising to return in the evening. Then silence fell over the house. Not one of us felt like eating anything. It was still hot and everything was just so strange. We let our large upstairs we let our large upstairs room to a certain Mr. Gottsmith, a divorced man in his 30s who appeared to have nothing to do on this particular evening. We simply just couldn't get rid of him without being rude. He hung on until about 10 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, Meep and Hank Van Sutton arrived. Once again, shoes, stockings, books, underclothes disappeared into Meep's bag and Hank's deep pockets. And at 11.30, they too disappeared. Oh man, by this time I was dog tired. And although I knew that it would be my last night in my own bed, I fell asleep immediately and didn't wake up until mommy called me at 5.30 the next morning. Luckily, it was not so hot as Sunday. Warm rain fell steadily, steadily all day, kind of like it's doing now. 
We put on heaps of clothes as if we were going to the North Pole. The sole reason being to take clothes with us. No Jew in our situation would have dreamed of going out with a suitcase full of clothing. I had on two vests, three pair of pants, a dress on top of a skirt, a jacket, a summer coat, two pairs of stockings, lace-up shoes, a woolly cap, scarf, and still more. I was nearly stifled. That means really, really hot. But no one even inquired about it. Margot filled her satchel with school books, fetched her bicycle, and rode off behind Meep into the unknown. As far as I was concerned, you see, I still didn't know where our secret hiding place was to be. At 7.30 in the morning, the door closed behind us. Morty, my little cat, was the only creature to whom I said farewell. She would have a good home with the neighbors. This was all written in a letter addressed to Mr. Godstew. There was one pound of meat in the kitchen for the cat, breakfast things lying on the table, strip beds, all giving the impression that we had left Helter Skelter. But we didn't care about impressions. We only wanted to get away, only escape and arrive safely, nothing else. I will continue tomorrow. Yours, Anne. Thursday, July 9th, 1942. Dear Kitty, so we walked in the pouring rain, Daddy, Mummy, and I, each with a school satchel and shopping bag filled with the filled to the brim with all kinds of things thrown together anyhow. We got sympathetic looks from people on their way to work. You could see by their faces how sorry they were. They couldn't offer us a lift. The gaudy yellow star spoke for itself. Only when we were on the road did Mummy and Daddy begin to tell me bits and pieces about the plan. For months, as many as of our goods and chattels and necessities of life as possible had been sent away and they were sufficiently ready for us to have gone into hiding of our own accord on July 16th. The plan had to be sped up 10 days because of the call up so our quarters would not be so well organized but we had to make the best of it. The hiding place itself would be in the building where daddy had his office. It was hard for outsiders to understand, but I shall explain that later on. Daddy didn't have many people working for him. Mr. Kralis, Kufius Meep, and Ellie Vossen, a 23-year-old typist who knew all about our arrival. Mr. Vossen, Eli's father, and two boys worked in the warehouse, but they had not been told. I will describe the building. There is a large warehouse on the ground which is used as a store. The front door to the house is next to the warehouse door and inside the front doorway is a second doorway, which leads to a staircase. There's another door at the top of the stairs which has a front, which has a frosted glass window, which office is written in black letters. That is the large main office, very light and very full. Eli, Eli, Ellie, Meep, and Mr. Kufus work there in the daytime. A small dark room containing the safe, a wardrobe, and a large cupboard leads to the somewhat the second small office. Mr. Crayler and Mr. Van Dam used to sit here. Now it's only Mr. Crayler. You can reach Crayler's office from the passage, but only through a glass door which can be opened from inside, but not easily from the outside. From Crayler's office, a long passage goes past the coal store, up four steps and leads to the showroom of the whole building, the private office. Dark, dignified furniture, linoleum carpets on the floor, radio, smart lamp, everything first class. Next door, there is a roomy kitchen with a hot water faucet and a gas stove. Next door, the WC, well, that's the first floor. A wooden staircase leads from the downstairs passage to the next floor. There's a small landing on the top. At the door at each end of the landing leads to a storeroom. One of those really steep Dutch staircases runs to the side opening onto the street. The right hand door leads to our secret annex. No one would ever guess that there would be so many rooms behind that plain gray door. 
There's just a little step in front of the door, then you are inside. There is a steep staircase immediately opposite of the entrance. On the tiny, on the left, a tiny passage brings you into a room, which was to become Frank's family bed sitting room. Next door is smaller room, study and a bedroom for the two young ladies of the family. On the right, a little room without windows containing the wash basin and a small WC compartment with another door leading to Margot in my room. If you go up to the next flight of stairs and open the door, you will simply are amazed that there could be such a big, bright room in such an old house by the canal. There is a gas stove in this room, thanks to the fact that it used to be a lavatory, which is a bathroom, and a sink. This is now the kitchen for the Van Dan couple, besides the general living room, dining room, and scullery. A little corridor will become Peter Van Dan's apartment. Then, just as the lower landing, there is a large annex. So there, I've, you, I've now introduced you to the whole of our beautiful secret annex. Yours and so they had to go into hiding and they hid in rooms that were built behind a bookcase. And I'm gonna show you the video to that um, in their dad's office building. So tomorrow we will see what their life was like while they were in hiding. Bye-bye.